Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Since, well, since the early days of semiconductors, you know, as the semiconductor technology has progressed, and there has always been this desire to improve computer arithmetic because new gates arrive, and you know, there is always the question of what is with these gates, how do you improve these basic uh, mathematical computations on, uh, on hardware. And news has been all along the way, the, at the forefront of computer arithmetic past uh, about 20, 30 years, something like that. So, um, Thank you. Thank you, Darko. He wants to make me even older than I actually am, but it's okay. That's that's very typical. But uh, it's true. It's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, just a few comments, uh, okay, about myself in a way. How I started with uh, computer arithmetic, because uh, for some people it's just a hobby. You know, you have those puzzles about numbers, and people think that's about it. What's there with arithmetic? But uh, no, I was actually being asked back in uh, old Yugoslavia to build a floating point unit. First, I had to understand what word floating point means, so I had to search for this, and finally, with a colleague, we built something uh, using. Uh, something called uh, MSI, Integrated Circuits. If you guys know what that is, uh, that was Fairchild Integrated Circuits. Now that name is probably gone from the screen. Oh, it's back, that's right, yeah. And we've had uh, even uh, register files made out of 16-bit uh, memories, four by four organized memories. So we made this arithmetic unit, and it worked. And then uh, an American visitor was uh, making a tour of the institute where I work, Institute Putin, and uh, that was Professor Norman Scott from the University of Michigan. So obviously he wanted to know how far we are advanced in our knowledge, and he said, you made uh, 48 by 48 multipliers in less than a microsecond? This is an achievement at that time. So uh, we know what we are doing. And then he recommended I come to the States and finish my studies in arithmetic. I had a fortune to work with Jim Robertson, who is considered as one of the originators of, uh, how to say, really hardware-oriented arithmetic. Lots of arithmetic done before, but not really hardware-oriented arithmetic. And uh, besides being designer of ILIAC II, uh, he really introduced some fundamental ideas, which actually took 15 years to penetrate the mind of industrial designers. So now these are quite common, and uh, I'll mention a few of the things as we go through. And so I did what uh, Darko said, follow the progress of semiconductors and keep reinventing some of their algorithms because there is a question. What do we do with all those transistors? So I suggest let's look at complex arithmetic. Okay. <laughs> so let me talk uh, about the work that I did jointly and still working with uh, Jean-Michel Mueller. They have a very good, one of the best group in arithmetic in Europe. They're in uh, Lyon in the Col Normal Superior. And uh, Jean-Michel is also quite a good mathematician and expert on things that uh, I'm not that good at, so it's a good combination. <coughs> all right, so that's basically <coughs> the problem. Uh, we all know we use software, and I just uh, heard that uh, you like to de in Microsoft you like to disable hardware and just emulate everything to reliable software. So that was not a good start for me, but I'll nevertheless persevere and <laughs> finish the talk. <laughs> What do we have? It's very interesting. Uh, when you look at the literature, what's there about the complex arithmetic, of course, uh, there are all kinds of uh, libraries and subroutines, but they look horrendous because they have to cope with all kinds of exceptions, overflow, underflows, and the rounding is a nightmare when it comes to these, actually, uh, routines. So in any case, from my point of view, and I'm somewhat simplistic, being more on the hardware side than on the software side, uh, you see, if you want even to take those routines and map them into hardware, they will not be efficient. They will take many more times, many more cycle times than necessary in order to do it. So we simply asked the question, how do we deal with that problem? And why would we consider it now? But if you look at the trend, 20 years ago you couldn't find the square root in machines, but now it's standard in many of the processors. So as the VLSI capacity grows, so will the intent to put uh, some pieces of hardware provided that we can validate them properly. 
and that we can assure that they work as intended. So lots of still ongoing controversy. Might make a slight digression. There is a group called uh, Computer Arithmetic Group. It's part of uh, Technical Committee on VLSI, and it's also part of SIGARC. There may be around 120 people. They have been fairly consistent over the last 30 years since I joined that group. Roughly 20% renewal rate every two years we meet. And they include people who I think also in industry play a role, like Gulliver from Intel, who is in charge of uh, software validation, like uh, David Bailey from NASA Ames, who is one of the gurus in uh, computation, and then people like Oberman and Mike Flynn and so on and so forth, who have done really lots of good work. Lots of Europeans are also in this group. So the group is alive, but it's not growing very much. So we probably need more Pentium bugs in order to get popularity and get young people to join in and start really studying the subject. But uh, it's, it's still alive. Anyhow, so we need uh, essentially uh, to develop a little more in order to use this VLSI capacity. So why not extend uh, arithmetic instruction sets? So subject of today's talk is our work essentially on complex arithmetic operations. And uh, we have our uh, favorite approaches to do arithmetic, and uh, one of those is so-called digit recurrence. In other words, uh, these are linear convergence algorithms, uh, but uh, you have a flexibility in choosing radix. So the number of actual cycles and steps uh, could vary according to the trade-offs you want. So we will show that essentially it's possible to adapt complicated complex operations to digit recurrence algorithms and solve essentially the key problem of these algorithms. Uh, I'll explain details in a second. Really. Okay. So the problem is, uh, how do I know which digit is the right digit of the result as you progress through it? Okay. So in uh, convergence methods, you don't pretend. You just do brute force applying big multiplications, hoping that the convergence will produce those correct digits. At the end, you worry how to round those things and so on and so forth. But here, what we want to do is the following. At every step, you produce a digit, and that digit won't change later on. So that gives, in a sense, uh, incentive. Now, I have to make some caveats about this. This, in a sense, uh, we can shoot that uh, we can do results that correspond to faithful rounding. But if you want to do correct rounding, meaning, uh, I mean, uh, doing the uh, IEEE, basically rounding, we have techniques that work for division and techniques that almost work for square root. Okay. Yes? Is there an IEEE standard for complex and no. no. So I have a free field, and my only problem is uh, Velo Kahan from Berkeley, Professor Kahan, because when he gets mad at us, and he does, he, then uh, we have a trouble really convincing him. That's another story, but maybe some other time. Maybe I shouldn't be talking about that because I'm being recorded. Yeah. He has done great things, really, to make us really do the honest work when implementing the algorithms. All right. So uh, there is a, also an interesting approach that we found useful in many arithmetic algorithms. You have, let's say, a domain of operands. If you prescale those operands, push them into a different range, all of a sudden the nature of the algorithm that you're implementing changes, becomes much simpler, which opens up actually quite interesting alternatives also for software people. Here is a simple illustration. If you want to do standard division in high radix, it's very difficult to do it because uh, the complexity of selection is high. But if you, for example, are prescaling divisor, make divisor very close to one by some multiplicative factor, all of a sudden this problem becomes very simple. You can select those high radix digits by simply rounding residual to the integer part and taking this value. Okay, so now, if I am a compiler writer, and I know how to detect lifetime of variables, and when those appear, and you tell me divisor is available now, I would ask you to prescale this while you're still not looking at division operation, and then we start doing division operation, we have a very simple operation to carry out. So lots of potential that's not explored, essentially, because the world of instruction set designers, and the world of arithmeticians, not necessarily very well integrated. So hopefully one day we'll do better than that. Okay, so prescaling is a solution for our problem. So basically we, in a nutshell, get simple digit selection. We can use standard digit recurrence. 
we think it's good for hardware, and then uh, it provides faithful rounding, and it could be used to do efficient correct rounding. Okay, so let's see where do we go. So that's roughly what I will go through. Please feel free to ask questions. First, I will explain the work that uh, been already published that's on complex division. So there are some comments on digit recurrence. I want you to understand first before we go into our solution for complex selection problem, implementation, comparisons, and so on. And this is a work that we just finished recently, and uh, that's on complex square root, but it's compatible fully with complex division, so I decided to talk uh, about it at the same time. All right, so here would be our uh, traditional thing, uh, conventional formula, interdivision system, textbook stuff, really, so it's, oh, okay, we know how to do all of those things. Yeah, you know, but uh, when you really apply to the real operands and so on and so forth, what we are getting, lots of overflows, intermediate computations, poor accuracy in many cases, and this certainly is not the formula to be used. In general, for complex division, not much done at the Carter. One of our students at UCLA did uh, some very specific uh, work in complex arithmetic, but that was geared for FPGAs, had some algorithms, but uh, not much else really available there. All right, so in 1962, to cope with the problem of these intermediate overflows and the numerical difficulties, uh, there is a Smith formula, okay, which looks something like that, okay? So you clearly, by the way, all of these operations will be done on the standard instruction set. These are the floating point operations. You have lots of roundings. You have lots of things that go on, and you have incredibly uh, obscure error analysis that you can use to find out what you're actually getting. So that eliminates most, but not all, intermediate overflows. Would require like four divisions, two reciprocals, eight multiplications. It's a costly thing. Then it was improved by Stewart, etc. And uh, nowhere we can guarantee correct rounding of real imaginary parts of the quotient. So, uh, of course, that's one of the motivations to look into alternative solutions. <clears throat> so I will do a little overview of the real or conventional so-called digit recurrence algorithms for division, and then we will see how these uh, directly apply, how they apply to the complex case, and why we can do it. Okay, so in a nutshell, if you want to do radix r division, we use uh, essentially paper and pencil method, right? Uh, so we define something called the residual, and we try to keep this residual bounded by subtracting divisor times the quotient digit. That's in a nutshell the problem. So the problem, of course, is uh, how do we select this quotient digit? Uh, I mentioned Jim Robertson. Uh, his uh, really great insight was uh, this problem to be solved in general, you have to allow redundancy in the representation. Uh, decision process, if you have redundancy, becomes far simpler than if you don't have it. So if we, for example, allow, let's say, sign digits from minus A to plus A, A can be suitably selected with respect to the radix, then we have effective theoretical methods for do the selection. But we not necessarily, for arbitrary radix, have effective practical methods for do do it. The complexity goes up in terms of the choices you have to make. So the idea, as I mentioned, is we keep basically residuals bounded and uh, uh, keep essentially uh, selecting digits according to some function. Now, latency proportional to the number of digits, so high radix, lower latency, that would be nice. However, cost delay, very prohibitive for the selection if you want to raise the value of the radix. So what we want, we would like basically to improve on that, and I'll show you some of the solutions. And then, of course, it would be nice to do easy quotient rounding. As you know, in uh, newton raphson multiplicative convergence methods for uh, floating point division, you really do have to do a multiplication, subtract from the dividend, look at what you're getting, and then perform the final rounding. In digit recurrence methods, you don't need to do those things. So techniques uh, have been shown that uh, they basically work just by adding extra digits and then being able to round. <clears throat> All right, so what has been done at the harder level since I keep talking about that? Okay, so it's a little, maybe, it's still very simplistic, but it gives you an idea what essentially uh, harder implementation would entail. So we can uh, assume that uh, residuals, Ws, are kept in a redundant form. Why is that necessary? You don't want to wait for long subtractions. So what you want to do is produce redundant form, like carry, save, sign digit, and so on. So at the core of the recurrence algorithm is uh, 
3 to 2 header. 3 operands in, 2 operands out. No carry propagation, that's nice. So, based on the estimates, leading bits in the Radix 4 case that requires taking 7 bits of, from those two registers, and then you have to infer what the value of the quotient is, such that you are guaranteed that the result you get after taking this quotient and multiplying the divisor and subtracting from the current residual, residual remains bounded. So the whole business of division is that story and goes on and on and people still learning about it. Okay. So what we have here are different parts. Obviously, this is something of concern because as the radix grows, this becomes far more complex than it would be in this case. Uh, so the critical part, if one looks, uh, that was done several years ago using a particular gate family. You can see it's quite indicative that most of the time is spent actually in the selection. And then, of course, there is buffering, there is multiplexing, and, uh, of course, the adder can use uh, internal optimization, so basically only one half adder delays what it takes to produce the result. So this problem, of course, uh, is solved using so-called uh, estimates and uh, staircase function. It's an interesting problem. People are essentially still trying to do... Um, how to say, uh, direct theoretical uh, derivation where those boundaries should be. But let me explain briefly just for the sake of generality. So this is uh, also another of Robertson's diagrams. Uh, so sorry for the somewhat ineligible marks. This is our divisor, and this is our partial remainder. And so basically, uh, a division usually fixes a divisor, right? It doesn't change during the process. And then what we have to find out is uh, what should be the quotient digit given a partial remainder such that uh, the partial, next partial remainder is bounded. And for that one can derive so-called selection regions. So basically what it says that uh, L2 line tells me that from this line up, quotient digit value 2 is okay. All right. And line U1 tells me this is the upper limit where I can choose the value 1. So in this overlap region, which is due to redundancy, I can choose either 1 or 2. All right, so that's just great. So instead of now having a linear function or some function, which would require full precision to evaluate, to do the selection, say, am I above, am I below, we can do the staircase approximation. And so we can use a finite small number of bits to for example, say, okay, so if I'm, for example, 6 eighths and below, I'm going to choose 1. If I'm 6 eighths and above, I'm going to choose 2, etc. And so you can see this staircase. We even have more choices in some regions. So here I can choose this, this, or that, and so on. So all of that is uh, given to the designers to improve, essentially, efficiency of this table lookup which could be a PLA and so on. And so now comes uh, the famous Pentium bug. And the story is really hilarious when you really think about the overall context of what happened. Okay. So once you do this table, you get certain complexity. The story goes that at some point the manager said, everybody try to reduce by 10% the real estate of your units. So they all went busy. And so a couple of smart guys who didn't take the proper arithmetic course decided that actually on the edge above, you can use those as don't cares. And in six cases, they, they hit, uh, hit it wrong. And those six cases, according to the press, cost $400 million later. On the other hand, not fair to say that there was a great deal of publicity for Intel products going through this, so maybe that was done. Fine. Yes? Some interviewer I mentioned at the conference said that a half billion was worth it for, for building the Pentium brand. <laughs> There's no such thing as bad news. There's no such thing. Yes. The day into decided to behave, everybody forgot the rest of the story. Maybe I should be taking more credit by not teaching students what's right. <laughs> <laughs> this might be very helpful. All right, so what happened basically, they finished the story, they improved the design, which now a new version was faulty, just to be told that they're not really in the critical part. And they can use the old design. But they said, but we use the, we develop new designs, so let's use the new design. So, okay, and there the story unfolded and created all the commotion. So, an unnecessary mistake uh, in a sense, but that's what can we do, happens. All right, so that's in a nutshell this problem. Now, obviously, if the radix increases, we won't be able to cope with this and the uh, staircase won't work. <coughs> 
So the better way to cope with the high radius is to do prescaling of operands. And so for a number of years, we've been looking into it and developed a number of schemes that was actually in the late 80s and 90s with it. So basically, you find a K. You multiply your divisor to be close to 1. You know, it's intuitively clear. If your divisor is 1, you have a very easy division problem, right? Does this preserve actually correctly? Uh, yes. Yes. So it can be done. So that's what is basically fine. OK. So now the point is, uh, if you basically now think uh, your uh, new divisor is of the form 1 plus some epsilon. But now you are doing the multiplication portion digits times this divisor and subtracting it from the residual. Obviously, 1 times quotient, since you're choosing quotient in such a way to reduce the residual, will not affect that part. So you have that digit already there. So you can just simply pick it up from there. And epsilon is all the way on the right side. So that's how it basically works. So then we can still use the standard recurrence to compute quotient digits. Now, the, there is a price. You need to obtain k. That's required table lookup and interpolation. You need to do some multiplication to prescale. And then you have to carry out recurrent step, which needs now multiply because sky radius. Here is an example of a scheme how divide, uh, divider or a division unit of that type would look like. So no more adder, but it's multiplier accumulator that's at the core. And uh, the most interesting part is that we can simply take the leading digits, the integer portion of the residual, and do some rounding and recoding to obtain, let's say, like 12 bits of the new quotient, and uh, do the multiplication and repeat that process. This part here essentially is the prescaling. From a module, we can get this uh, constant to do the scaling. And then we have to make a pass through this in order to perform the scaling. We scale both uh, dividend and the divisor. So at the end, we don't need to do post scaling. So the quotient has the same digits as if we did not do the essentially that stuff. OK, so that was kind of a brief overview of what uh, uh, exists uh, in a conventional real domain. And now we want to apply those things for the complex. So standard stuff used. Uh, what we look at those things, and the most interesting things is that we are able to separate the recurrences and run independently real and imaginary and do essentially selection using the same tricks as we do for the real one. Okay, so here would be uh, a selection problem if we didn't do pre scaling. So you can think that uh, <coughs> we have uh, the real part and the complex part, things become, yes. I presume the problem is just pre-scaling the divider with four more three. That is what you're right. Okay. So basically, you, you have here far more complicated situation to do the selection. And uh, so, like, for example, here are the cho You can see here that in this uh, region, okay, so this is choice is i or minus i. And here, between this point and this point, choice would be 0 for imaginary. And same thing for the real, 0 plus 1 and minus 1. And all the combinations would happen. Now, if you increase the radix, which is the objective, obviously, this diagram becomes quite, quite more complicated. And that just for one point in the overall selection table. So could not really do it like that. So instead of doing this, uh, the thing is that um, you're, you want to make the residual get smaller, so you, you're using the the uh, the uh, to measure that. So basically, now we simply apply the same trick as we did for real division. So we want to do, of course, these are complex quotient, dividend, divisor. So we would do prescaling. And so we want uh, that uh, find the complex factor k and do the multiplication, complex multiplication. Obviously, it's more complicated than in the real sense. And we want uh, that this norm satisfies some 2 to the minus p. As you said, that should become closer to real. Yes. OK. So this p is a parameter of the algorithm, and we will see the implications of that. So then, basically, we will get the initial dividend, which is complex, k times z. z was the original dividend. And uh, new uh, divisor, which is k times d. And now, if one carries uh, 
of exercise of algebra through this, one can very nicely separate those things and obtain for real and imaginary parts and to do quotient that is separate. And that was essentially, I think, uh, uh, a good progress for this type of algorithms. So the same recurrence applies. These are now complex quantities. So we have scaled y, which would satisfy these properties like one, lots of zeros, and then some digits. That's basically what we obtain. Now, there would be real and imaginary part of the portion digit. And then we can really show that uh, by induction that uh, standard relation holds. And that means that any choice of those QIs for which uh, we can bound WJ, as long as it is bounded, is sufficient to give us the string that corresponds to the quotient, all the real digits and the complex digits, the imaginary digits. So how does this actually show up? <coughs> So we pre-scaled divisor y, and it's basically close to 1. That was the objective. So we would then like to get quotient digit by simply rounding residual to the nearest integer. And that can be obtained uh, kind of not that difficult to see why is that the case, because uh, you uh, have this 1, lots of zeros, and some digits. These digits that are way below don't affect the selection problem, and that's why you can do the round. So we would have some function s. We will take the estimate. This is real. This is imaginary. Estimate of the shifted residual and uh, obtain those digits. What we have to, because we do rounding, then there would be some relation. When I take a quantity x and round this from the real x, the bound would be like 1 half, because it's in the middle. And because I did truncation in the estimate, I will have also some sigma bit that I would have to account for. So there would be a little uh, part here that plays a role in uh, deciding about the parameters. So now the digits that we will use will be from the same set, from minus a to plus a. And obviously, that's a redundant set. And then we have a little more thing to uh, cope with. <coughs> Let me explain. If you want, right, but that's kind of obvious. If you want to keep something bounded, and you have uh, some quantities, and uh, the choice for the uh, quotient digit is limited to be at most a, then tells you how large this residual can be. If it's larger, you don't have a choice. And so and that basically this formula says how large it could be. Let's call it capital omega. So and then we can basically make sure that this uh, initial residual is less than omega. We can shift for that. And then we want to make sure that for all j's, this is true. <coughs> so by induction, this can be shown that uh, if omega j, wj is less than omega, that this can be shown. And from that, uh, we basically establish that uh, next residual is bounded by this quantity now. And so we got now what is p. Remember, initial scaling should produce essentially p leading zeros. That's what we wanted in the radix 2 case. So we got a formula which relates parameters p, parameter sigma, and uh, radix r, and digit value a. From that formula, we can derive what would be the implication for the design. So here we have the radix, 2, 4, 8, 16. And uh, here is the digit set value. So A is the largest magnitude, right? So typically it's 1, minus 1, 0, or 1. But we can allow minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. And it has interesting implications. So the P is important factor. And that's something that's going to essentially attract or essentially tell hazard designers you can do it or you don't want to do it. Okay, because the table for pre-scaling requires address of 2p plus 1. Okay, to do that. Hmm? And uh, consequently, it's nice if you can reduce it. So it's interesting if you use more redundancy, it becomes simpler. And that's nice, okay. And so we can basically use only 7 bits to address the table, which is fine for. Okay, so these are the bounds on the residual, no need really to go through them. And this is the number of fractional bits you have to know. This is important. 
When you make this structure, whatever it is, that means carry propagation is limited only to four fractional bits, and that's what makes the loop fast. And that's what you would like to have. So we can see, obviously, when we get into something like eight, we are talking two to the 17th size of the pre-scaling table, but I will make comments what else can be done in order to, in order to cope with this complexity. All right, so now after all this work, uh, this is uh, our new complex division. So we have the real recurrence and we have imaginary recurrence and it has obviously somewhat more complication because we have to take into account, uh, by the way, this is in a paper that appeared last year in ASAP and uh, you can send the paper whoever wants to take a look at it. Let's really uh, describe there how it's obtained. I just want to focus on the structure of this phase. So we still have a to shift uh, uh, residual, this is now just the real part. We will have a real quotient digit, an imaginary quotient digit, and we will be multiplying real part of the divisor, and we will be multiplying imaginary part of the device. So when you look at this, this is just a division recurrence. And similar one with some of different signs exists for imaginary part. So now two recurrences are running in tandem, producing those digits, cross multiplying each other and producing the complex quotient. Yeah, and actually this looks exactly like the real formula if you combine the real and... That is correct. That is the same formula. That is correct. That is correct. But have to go around in order to... And that's what we would like to do. Now, the, you, that's a good observation. And the property that uh, digit recurrence algorithms don't cause those overflows, intermediate problems that are obtained when you use the uh, standard textbook formulas, essentially justify this approach. That's correct. All right, so we therefore can now do selection based for a real part of the quotient digit on the real residual, for imaginary on the imaginary, so they're separate. So we will need basically two vector by digit multipliers per recurrence and some reduction. I have some figures really to make this a little less dry. So, in a nutshell, each recurrence would then involve, uh, let's say, uh, four to two adder because we have to reduce uh, two vectors from the residual and uh, two uh, imaginary and real products with corresponding uh, quotient digits. So, in general, depending on the radix, this could be a complicated circuit because it's really a rectangular multiplier and 4 to 2 adder will produce the next residual that repeats. Now we will do round and recode because we might get out of range digits so we need to do some recoding to get it back. So that's the structure. We could uh, make trade-offs and maybe have it like this. In other words, uh, these generators need not have a CPA, need not produce uh, just one bit factor, could leave it redundant and you will pay price by having 6 to 2 adder instead of 4 to 2 adder because you will have redundant uh, and that's much faster. So things of that kind, that's just an illustration that there are lots of options once you have the uh, recurrence that uh, is uh, friendly for implementation. So if you were to do strictly conventional formula, two real divisions, two squarings and four multiplications would be required. If you just uh, emulate what you have from the formula. But it's not really to be implemented rounding overflows and so on. So compared to real recurrence, 4 to 2 adder is used of 3 to 2 adder. And the delay is slightly longer because uh, the recurrence is a little fatter, has one more term than for the regular division. And of course the cost is twice as much because you have to have two of those to carry both parts. Now, prescaling is a tricky part, okay? And uh, <clears throat> so there are lots of things that one would have to still invent in order to make it uh, more practical than it is. So there are some ideas how to derive. That, that's what you want. You want to find k, complex number, and you multiply complex divisor to get something that's bounded as a norm to, to the minus p. And so you could do direct table lookup. There has been a lot of work and interesting results in bipartite tables, which are essentially are smaller tables, multiple of them, which require extra addition to combine the results. It's based on Taylor series expansion of approximation, so that's quite nice. And we also could consider hybrid method. Use the lower radix to do simple 
rescaling, but when you build up enough of accuracy, switch to high radix and continue with the high radix. So it would be a non-uniform from this point of view, but uh, attractive. We haven't done detailed evaluations of those alternatives, so I cannot really tell you, but like for example, I don't know whether we should go to all the details, but there are some interesting observations. <clears throat> for example, if we assume that the uh, norm of D complex divisor is between one half and one, so D is basically represented by some fixed point numbers would appear in this form. It's very interesting that in order to satisfy this norm, it's okay if one of those has a, like a leading zero. No problems with that, right? And so consequently, we can act a little cheap in trying to save on the size of the table by observing those things. Save one bit in the address, which is not bad. It cast them. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's okay. And then we can basically define A hat, B hat as A and B from the previous one when you round them to Q fractional bits. And so your factor K, factor K should be of this form, which are now, these are truncated, right? Rounded, actually. And so consequently you have a small number of bits that you have to deal with. So basically you will have table with 2 Q minus 1. That minus 1 comes from the remark I just made. So then we can call D cap, that's obtained from this approximation. So do a little manipulation of that and establish link between uh, 2 to the minus P and 2 to the minus K plus 1. And that tells you that uh, if we choose uh, Q P plus 1, then lookup table will give us basically what we want, but that requires 2 P plus 1 bits. So if we now look into what we had before, clearly there is a little problem how far we can go. Okay. Uh, not that we could say offhand. But it doesn't really cost you anything. To no, okay. it really doesn't. It, it really just balances more. In, this is a standard trick for the tables when you're developing. It just the digit that is correct. That is correct. Okay, so this is just, yeah, okay. I was wondering whether you could use a much smaller table and just use a new step to... That's a, that's a possibility. If you're doing a approximate. That's a, that's a possibility to combine those. In a real division, that has been done, and people have played those games. We haven't explored, but that's definitely a valid idea. Or, as I said, you first do small radix, like radix 4. You build up things, because, for example, for radix 4, well, these are not that small tables, but they're okay. Like, uh, like we use table 2 to the 9, that's within the realm of what people write today. Um, I just think what people are willing to put up for video games, we can afford some of those things, right? <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't be that shy. <laughs> it's important. If you tell children complex arithmetic is very important for you. And they'll say, yeah, get me a bigger table. Yeah. But uh, this is uh, frustrating, right? We wouldn't quite like to have this there. And then, as you said, maybe some hybrid methods are necessary. Okay, so this is also interesting. This is a standard bipartite approach where you split, uh, let's say, address into three, let's say, fields. And then you use two tables which are smaller in overall capacity than a single table. So what happens there? <coughs> is now for this one is very interesting. Okay, so Jean-Michel came up with some really nice ideas about that and then applied standard solution. You, we're really looking into something like that, right? That's our scale factor. Uh, so that really looks like that. So actually, we are having our general problem. We want to find a good approximation for function which is x over x squared plus y squared. And so we just focus on this. And we know that x and y are qubit numbers. So we want to minimize the size of that state. OK, so that can be done following bipartite approach. OK, that's really busy. Basically, should not be allowed to show slides like that. But nevertheless, I can just uh, navigate through a few of those things. So first of all, we're interested in Q bit because we want to access the table. And so let's assume that it's multiple of 3 and K is this essentially factor. And then we start splitting things into 2k bit numbers, k bit numbers, and k plus k over 2 bit numbers. So the point of that is, so in other words, our x is decomposed like this, and our y is decomposed like that. And then we use high part and low part, which basically are k and k plus 2 bits. So 
standard Taylor series will tell us that we can define function beta, function gamma, which depend on these subparts of the vectors. So that finally, our problem can be solved by doing this addition of three outputs of three tables. So each that would guarantee error of minus 3k, 2 to the minus 3k, and since q is 3k, we are done. And so instead of having two q minus 1 address bits, we will have uh, three tables each 4q over 3. So we are reducing the overall uh, demand, and uh, there is a very specific way how you can fill those tables, and these are the operands that you will have to use in order to calculate uh, what goes in the table. So that would be interesting, and as I mentioned already, that would be another approach. So first do low radix, and then switch to the high radix. Okay, so a few comments uh, about the uh, rounding. So. <clears throat> We, in a sense, always return digits for the convergence, which are valid, okay? And uh, they will never change. So in that sense, if we stop computation after we com computed qj, we know exactly what's the maximum possible error. Okay. So now, since a is less than equal r minus 1, so we know this is, at most, the weight of the last digit you have computed, so you are there at ulp level, and so consequently you do get a faithful rounding by simply stopping the calculation. Is it almost real or almost imaginary that if the round of point is way, way smaller, is that a correct rounding? That's no. Okay, so correct rounding is different than faithful rounding. You see, faithful rounding simply means that uh, when you round computed result, you get no more than one ulp the error. But uh, for the correct rounding, you, sh you should get one half of the loop. Okay? So for that, we have a solution that's a little more complicated. Uh, in most of the cases, we can do correct rounding. But there are some cases when you get essentially leading zeros in the quotient for various reasons that you cannot do it. Then you would have to know how many leading zeros you have, have that many extra iterations, and then you can do it. So it's not as elegant as... Uh, the method itself for faithful rounding. Okay, so let's now switch uh, to complex uh, square root. <coughs> Lots of uh, solutions proposed for that, and uh, some were done theoretically to minimize the number of total operations, but this is what uh, is a typical solution and can be found in software libraries that are building it now. This doesn't look very friendly. First, you have to calculate this W. That's all floating points. So if you look, there we have a division. We do squaring. We take square roots, uh, etc., etc. Once we calculate this W, then we have to do some testing and basically obtain the final result, uh, the square, complex square root of the argument, uh, like those four cases, depending what value of W is obtained. So one wouldn't think of uh, uh, taking this and building hardware exactly for that. That's clear. And you can see three square roots, two division operations, and plus some other test operations. And so I don't want to touch that. Okay. So what can we do for uh, our approach? <coughs> so the basic iteration is derived as follows. So D is a complex number, and let's say less than two, put a norm on this. Now, digit recurrence algorithm will produce some digits S0, S1, S2, etc. So, they are complex and they are in the redundant digit set. Now, we can define no reason to behave any differently complex residual. Simply, that's D minus square of the result uh, properly adjusted because you carried J iterations. So, that's a standard trick. And from this residual, we obtain the recurrence. Now, that's exactly like a real recurrence, completing the square. Okay. So, what do we do with that? <coughs> okay. So, again, if we keep WJ bounded, then any choice of SJs will do. Okay. So, then we can separate, basically, in WJ, do a little algebra, and separate real and imaginary parts, and, again, two recurrences pop up. Okay. So, it looks very similar like the previous one. But it has this factor, which is weighted by minus j minus 1. That means this is the term that's fading away 
as you are doing the calculations because it's being shifted in each step one more position to the right. So analogous form for the imaginary part. So again, how to select these digits? And one can immediately figure out how to select them, really. If you really look, uh, we're looking for uh, basically this digit, okay? And uh, if we know that, for example, we are scaling S in such a way that's converging towards 1, okay, then this part vanishes. So we can simply say that this digit could be chosen as uh, essentially one half of rounded value of that. So we are going to see on the next slide a little more detail of that. So first of all, we are saying this part fades away, so it decreases. So SJ is close to 1. So if real part is close to 1 and imaginary close to 0, then this would be close to basically this term here. We are looking for that. So simply, we can calculate it like that. OK, so that's what we basically propose and, of course, use. So now we have to make a prescaling, achieve this uh, SJ moving close to 1. Now, when we do that, we'll get some leading uh, zeros or leading ones. That means that we don't need to start from the very first iteration. We can start from some J0 iteration because we already have those things accumulated and then use selection by rounding because this is all uh, in uh, line with the theory that we showed before. So of course you want estimates again, you don't want full precision thing. Now here what we will do is the following. So we will do basically pre-scaling, then we'll do recurrence evaluation, but now we have to do post-scaling, you know, because the result is not correct because of the pre-scaling factor. And then we would have to convert these redundant things and do the rounding. So there are essentially four parts. I didn't mention anything about quotient on the fly conversion and rounding, but it would be similar like in division. So how do we do prescaling? There would be table lookup. We'll get this factor k, complex numbers. And then we will also store post-scaling factor in the same table. So the tables are wider. Okay? And uh, these are the real and imaginary parts and we would need a complex multiplier. That's not too elegant. So we are go now going to combine this with recurrences and get it in online fashion, essentially. So at the end, see, that's what we need to produce. We calculate the square root of d, have to multiply by this post-scaling factor. Okay, so that's a little busy scheme, but I will basically explain probably better than just talking about the algorithms. So from the real and imaginary part of the operands that come in parallel form, pre-scaling block uh, will produce scaled real and scaled imaginary divisor and produce these post-scaling consta constants, uh, imaginary and real. Mm -hmm. Here is the residual loop for the uh, real part and similarly for the imaginary part. And uh, they have to, of course, use each uh, other and we produce single digits, like a real digit and imaginary digit. Now, as these digits are produced, they're used inside the recurrence, but they're also used to keep multiplying those post-scaling factors. And that's done using left-to-right multipliers. So each left-to-right multiplier produces more significant digit per step, which you can then recode and add and do the so-called on-the-fly conversion. So by the time recurrence is done, if you incorporate rounding, you can also get rounded real and imaginary parts. So that's uh, in a nutshell how the scheme works. That's what the algorithm does and now there are some details. So here are the actual recurrences. Uh, just to point out really, okay, so we still do the rounding on the estimate. We form two factors f and g and you can see the structure digits times a vector and the square of a digit. Similar for this one. And then this, is, this looks like a standard recurrence, shifted residual, and those two factors added. Pretty similar for the imaginary part. So the scheme itself uh, uh, would be implemented using two structures. So the rounding of the estimate, that's relatively simple. F network and G network requires digit and vector to do the multiplication. And then sign digit adder, let's say, to reduce those things. Would be again 6 to 2 doing that job, and similarly for the uh, imaginary part. 
Okay, so here are the details, but I basically mentioned really what's going to happen with post scaling. Uh, in order to do that, in each step we have to add this, but we can do it essentially online during the left to right because every time we get this one, we can add this CR, etc. That's how basically implementation would work. So these are the corresponding recurrences. Uh, this is typical left to right uh, multiply. Basically, what we do. We take the fraction part and the integer part. Don't do round, don't do anything. Just take it as is. And the uh, integer portion of some UR, that's the value accumulated in the product, will give you the digit that should go out. And the fraction portion will give you what remains in the loop. And you keep uh, iterating this. Now, these digits will be over redundant since you are just taking, not rounding, not balancing anything. So we will need to do recoding, but that proves to be uh, simpler than uh, doing uh, uh, some other definition. So here is the summary. They're all redundant. So recode, then add them online, and then use on-the-fly conversion to perform essentially final conversion. So what about this on-the-fly conversion? On-the-fly conversion essentially works as follows. You're getting positive and negative digits in order to deliver in each step, in J steps, J correct digits, you have to know what's coming, but you don't know. So you prepare both. So when you receive the right digit, you say this is valid, this is not valid, and you continue like that. Now, for the rounding, you have to add third conditional form, which says if you have to round, it would be by one larger. Okay? So then you will deliver this when it's necessary. So no extra delay in order to produce essentially rounded result. Hmm? Maintaining two potential results. That is correct. Always just, just two potential results. Just two potential. Okay, so you keep calculating. Okay, so that's an interesting problem. Uh, suppose you are getting a stream in a binary case of minus one, zeros, and ones. So if you start, let's say, you obtain first digit, like in division, is one. And uh, if the next digit is one, yeah. then you know that the first one is final. It cannot be changed. Uh, but if you receive the zero, yeah, right. If you, if you receive next digit zero, then you don't know. So what do you do? Then you prepare. It's going to stay one, and it's going to be zero. And then multiplexing those two forms. So it's an algorithm that's kind of quite easy to implement. It doesn't cost uh, much, and it doesn't cost a delay, which is the most important thing. Anyhow, so the pieces fit together. So the, the bottom line is that we could do efficient, harder implementation of complex square root and division using the same tricks that we use uh, for real division. Oh, here is, uh, we use, by the way, Maple to do all our high-level simulations. So here is an example running complex uh, square root uh, 19 over 11 plus i 9 over 11, radix 2, and these are the parameters like uh, p, a, sigma, and running for 30 steps. So after the scaling, rescaling, this is what we should start with. Okay? And then uh, the result is appearing, so getting just real, zero, real, zero, real, zero. Here is both real and imaginary, real and imaginary, real, 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 real and imaginary. Depends how they come up. This is not too interesting, but of course we like to show computed value after conversion and post-scaling and exact value. So not a proof, but a nice encouragement when you run those things and you don't get something that looks ugly. <laughs> right. We have seen those things before, right? Okay. So what we have essentially are, uh, I think, uh, algorithms which are efficient for complex division and square root, require pre-scaling, but allow selection by rounding, which is nice. If the harder capacity grows, you can be more ambitious with the choice of the radix. Digit recurrences have rounding advantages. Division about four times faster than Smith's algorithm square root, at least two times faster. I think it's like 2.5 times faster than the corresponding implementation based on software. Now, cost of implementing complex division roughly twice. While for complex square root, because you have to have two square root units acting in parallel, division and so on, roughly the same. So that's basically what uh, general characteristics are. So as we said, faster, better, and so on. So that's it's a good solution to consider. Okay, lots of work done before. Like this is an interesting paper in 96, fast high precision computation of complex square roots. 
gets it right from the complexity point of view, shows the minimal number of operations, but forgot to count overflows and underflows and all of those things. So it's kind of useless. <laughs> Can't do much with this. Theoretically, this is very nice, but cannot apply it. Okay, this is a good paper which essentially uses complex division and complex square root. That's uh, by uh, Demel and Kahan, who are quite familiar with the work in arithmetic. And then there are lots of work that's been done in uh, high radix square routing in the 80s, 90s, and so on. Uh, right, all real, all real, basically. This is a very good work on multipartite. Uh, table lookups, which I think uh, is a technique that deserves actually more work because uh, uh, perhaps technology would support uh, more regular structure better than some logic. Then, of course, uh, we had some attempts to formalize all of these things in uh, two of the books, basically, and you can find most of the stuff in general I talked about there. So that was in ASAP uh, last year, and uh, hopefully this year in ASAP we'll have uh, this one here. There was some work on complex SVD because the question is where do you want to use those things? But the SVD is probably the biggest user of those things and singular value decomposition complex is actually quite important in many areas. I'm not an expert on those, I venture to say how important, but definitely it would be nice to have it. And uh, so there are some references that are essentially related to this. That's basically the end. Uh, most of the software stuff we used from Smith, and uh, that's pretty much implemented in some of the libraries that we have seen. Okay, I guess uh, I finished ahead of time. I told you it's going to be fast because it's harder. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, I noticed the software guys throw over around the top. <laughs> so, uh, I can understand how you could. Uh, if you consider interval arithmetic, for example, I can understand how you could uh, uh, easily change the rounding modes for the division, complex division, to get the origin and corner of the plot for the complex box. But the square root seems that, uh, because of all those close steps and then on the fly, it seems like the it's not a simple change in the digit selection to get you know, rounding up. Rounding out, rounding in. For the, okay, again, for the faithful rounding, we can say something, but uh, for the correct rounding, we cannot yet. Right. Uh, yeah, but for interval, I think faithful rounding is fine. That would be fine. Yeah. But, but how would you do it for the square root algorithm? That's, I think the square root algorithm has so many intermediate steps that there's not a single... Okay, so here is uh, uh, basically uh, the fact that uh, the digits we produce uh, are from the redundant digit set, but they will not change as you proceed. The algorithm converges, so that's the first step. So you have performed, let's say, J steps, and you stop at this point. So now you're asking where is your result with respect to infinitely precise result that you would compute. And we say it's within one loop. Yes, but can you guarantee that it's above or below? But, but I said in division, we can't. Right, it's like not, it's not in this way. We can only say in absolute sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay, any other questions, general in general? No, no, they are testing programs. As a matter of fact, uh, Professor Kahan's uh, paranoia is one of those <laughs> that can be used. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there are a few of our members of arithmetic uh, group, like uh, Parts, uh, who actually, as a consultant, maintains a large number of uh, techniques and software tools to analyze things. Now, uh, lately, the most prevalent way of checking how well those things work is to use uh, mechanical theorem proving. And there are a few people familiar with that. One is David Rusinov. Typically, you need a, a body of several hundred lemmas to establish for your design. And after that, you can apply the mechanical theorem proving. And uh, this is an extremely labor-intensive activity. The French people are also doing a good job. They now have a, 
uh, tools that prove that your proofs are correct. It is also very important because, you know, these uh, formal things sometimes look formidable. And there are lots of things that you cannot claim. They are complete in a sense. They look okay and you can do it. But so it's a, it's a difficult area. Uh, my uh, belief is that the uh, right way for designers is uh, to establish uh, well-proven hardware libraries and only be allowed to use those and not uh, to venture into some uh, uh, optimizations to save a little here, a little there. So design should be valid by construction rather than by uh, a posteriori analysis because that's very difficult. I understand now in soccer, lots of activities in validation since it's maturing. At least in our department, we have two people, young people who are really doing a really good work in trying to show for software how you can verify things. In, in your performance comparisons, you, I, I gather you're including the cost of converting into a redundant scheme and then converting back out after yeah. the line. Uh, what, if, what if you just made this part of a great big online process where you didn't have to do the conversions? How much faster would it be then? You mean keep everything redundant? Yeah. Okay. We looked at this problem. Okay. So, and that problem, once people dis discovered the virtue of uh, redundancy uh, in the 50s, uh, was immediately attractive. But at that time, the cost of flip-flops, registers, and so on, it was unthinkable that you would double the memory size to keep something redundant. So they gave up very quickly on that idea. Uh, it wasn't clear to me why they didn't think of uh, high rate carry save. In other words, you save every 8 bit like a carry. You don't have to have every bit. But that's a different story. Okay. So the studies have been done at UBIAS at UCLA and also in Mike Flynn's group at Stanford. They claim that it would be useful to have all redundant processors. Um, but actually, the improvements are, uh, I think, in the noise range when it comes to the performance and uh, cannot be really exploited in my opinion that well. The reason for that is that you have to do conversions all the time because the tests cannot be done on redundant forms and unfortunately programs <laughs> rely on so many tests that uh, this essentially kills things. Now if you're for example doing a sequence of operations, that's another favorite topic talking and uh, I'm all in favor of uh, us looking into fragments, the blocks, and converting them into like arithmetic engines. They do just those things. Okay. Then you're perfectly fine to use any representation and redundancy works well. Like we know how, for example, if we have a multiplication followed by division, there's really no reason to have a carry propagate header in multiplier because your product can enter the game of division in a redundant form and happily be used like that. But of course, this is not standardized. And this is a trade-off we have to make. Uh, reconfigurable technologies uh, offer lots of promise, right? But uh, it's not that simple. I'm old enough to realize that we have ingenious ideas. But if you and few of your friends are the only people understanding that, forget about that because uh, at one point there would be a smart guy who finds something and wants to fix it and there is nobody else to help him with that and he will not use it and so that's a problem how do you make it general at the same time and yet specific to answer design issues well the hope is we get better software that manages all of that so we don't have people involved maintaining those things and helping us well, maybe. So redundancy on the overall scale, uh, not uh, that efficient. But I'm not saying this is the uh, scientific result. It's more like what we have tried to do. Any other questions? So, okay. Thank you very much for being here.